tomorrow. But uh, anyway, happy to be here. So why don't we begin with one more word of prayer? We can't have enough prayer. And so then we'll begin our presentation. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for your wonderful blessings and this opportunity to, uh, to be here with our friends and family in the faith uh, here in, in Elgin. Lord, I just pray that you will bless tonight by your spirit, that you will open to us an understanding of your word and uh, prepare us, Lord, for how we can be more effective in your service and how we can walk more closely with you. For this, Lord, we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I don't know. Are you guys used to looking at this thing up here? Or, I don't know. Hopefully it's not too small for everyone to see what's up there. But uh, powerful intercessory prayer, Jesus' way. Also titled prayer and soul winning. So I tell a story about a man named John. And this man was... A call porter many years ago, but he had some difficulty speaking. He tended to stutter a lot and stumble in his words. And the call porter leaders said, you know what, this guy, he's never going to make a call porter. He's not going to sell any books. He can't really speak well when he goes up to the door or pretty much any time for that matter. Well, the man really had a burden on his heart to be a call porter, to do mission work for the Lord. And so he, he just uh, said, please give me some books. And they said, well, give him some books and let him go somewhere and he can try it. You know, he's probably not going to do anything. So he took his books and he went and lo and behold, he came back with some sales. He thought, hey, that's pretty good. And uh, so he did it some more and he kept coming back with a whole bunch of sales. And they were like, what's going on? You know, this guy, we know he can't really speak very well. What's happening out there? And so they said, we're going to go out and co porter with you and see what's happening and what you're doing because he's really coming back with a ton of uh, sales. And so they went out with him and, and they're coming up to the first house and they're ready to, to go up to the door. And so they start walking and then they get up close to the house and they look around and they realize, hey, where'd he go? Uh, this guy, this co porter, John, uh, he, he was missing. So they kind of went back and there he was behind a bush on his knees, <laughs> praying, praying for God uh, to bless the work. And so he prayed and he went up there and he got some books sold. And he kept doing that as he went to each house. He would spend that time especially praying and asking the Lord for his blessing. And God was giving him sales and he became one of the best co-porters that they had uh, at the time. Pretty amazing, right? Yes, cool. that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah, what the Lord can do, right? Lord can really bless when we seek Him, when we rely on His power. It's not all about the, the might or ability that we possibly could have, but it's about what God can do when, when we're willing to seek Him and ask for His power and ask for His blessing. Uh, there's another story about a pastor in Africa who was having many baptisms and many blessings and things going on in his church. and. The guys up at the conference heard about it. You know, what's happening with that church down there? They are really growing. And so they wanted to come down and see what's happening at that church. And how, how is it that they're growing so well? So they came down and they asked the pastor, what are you doing around here to make this place grow? He said, well, I'll show you. He said, all right. So he said, come on back to my, my back office here. And so they all, you know, several guys from the conference, they came back there and began uh, praying. He had them kneel down and they started praying. And and then they just kept on praying and this pastor kept on praying and it got to be about an hour and you know the conference guys were sort of you know shifting around on their knees it was kind of sore after a while and so they were about ready to give up and i think they kind of shuffled off into you know to the side well after six hours the guy finished his prayer <laughs> he said that's what we're doing around here and it works that prayer right it's how you rely upon god's power and uh, the Lord blesses, right? When we have the Spirit of God. You think about Jesus. How did Jesus do ministry? Did he often spend whole nights in prayer? Did he spend much time seeking the Father in heaven, seeking for those blessings? Yeah, Jesus was always in prayer. He prayed for his disciples, like Peter. He says, the devil is trying to sift you, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you're converted, he said, strengthen your brethren. And we see in John 17, that, that night that Jesus was in Gethsemane, 
he poured out his heart to the Father in prayer. And it was a prayer, yes, for himself uh, in that particular prayer at the beginning of it, but for all the believers too. It was, it was for, you see the whole last part of that prayer in John 17, Jesus was praying for his disciples, he's praying for the, the wider groups of his disciples, and he's praying for his followers in the future and those who would believe on his name. Even us today, we're included in that prayer of Jesus. And so what a, what a life of, of intercession that uh, Jesus lived. Just like the priests would intercede for those who were praying and petitioning God's throne, Jesus also intercedes for us even today. All right? But he gives us the example of a life of prayer in soul winning. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are essential uh, for winning souls, right? If there's no uh, power and presence of Jesus with us, and if we don't have the presence of the Spirit with us, then we're not going to be effective, right? Because the, it's the Holy Spirit who touches hearts, right? It's the presence and grace of Jesus, the love of Christ that melts hearts. And without that blessing, without that grace from God, there's no way that we can effectively win souls, right? The work of the Spirit is to bring conviction to the hearts of the people. That's right. Is going to bring conviction. You know, I think about, too, the story of the disciples when they were out fishing. They went out fishing for the whole night, and they didn't catch anything. And then they saw Jesus in the morning, and he called out to them, and he said, Hey, cast the net on the, was it the right side of the ship. He said, Cast it out there, and you'll get something. They said, Well, I don't know. We've been fishing all night. And with that direction from Jesus, they said, You know what? We'll just listen to your word, and we'll put down the nets. And they got more fish than they could hardly hold on to, right? So the nets were even breaking, right? So we can see that it is when we listen to the voice of Jesus, when we have Him guiding us and directing us, that our efforts become very successful. Otherwise, it could be laboring and toiling all night and maybe not catch a thing. So we must have that power and that presence of Jesus. In John 15, 5, Jesus said, For without me you can do how much? Nothing. Nothing. And so soul winning requires the presence of Jesus. In fact, he promised to be with us. You have your Bibles handy? I don't like to put all the verses on the screen. Uh, oftentimes I put some of them, but I like to look in our Bibles. You know, if I put everything on the screen, nobody will open up the, the good book, right? <laughs> So, uh, this here is Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, and, uh, 18 through 20. You have the Great Commission. And Jesus says that all power is given to Him in heaven and earth. Right? All power. And so, that is the power that is needful for the work of winning souls. You notice that uh, as He commands and calls His disciples to go out and to teach all nations and to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says that, uh, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, right? Jesus says he'll be with us as we're going out there to win souls. And it is that promise that he fulfills. It is the presence of Jesus that makes the effort successful when it comes to winning souls. It is his grace working upon hearts, upon our heart, as someone who's reaching out to save the lost, and working upon the hearts of those that we are seeking to save, right? So Jesus works powerfully in that way. Praying together for souls will draw the presence of Jesus nearer to us. Doesn't he also promise there in Matthew 18, he says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, right? And what a wonderful promise that is. So when we gather together to pray, even like this evening, just gathering together and praying and seeking the Lord, God sends His blessing. And that is, that is essential for, again, for the power needed to win souls, right? And the grace needed to win souls. All right, what a wonderful promise that Jesus gives us. He assures us that we, we never go alone when we seek Him and we go forward in His work according to his direction, right? Yes? Yes, uh, what I've been doing from usually noon on, on Friday until noon on mm -hmm. Saturday, mm -hmm. fasting, but I, uh, each morning after we have our devotionals, I ask, mm -hmm. what would you have me to do today? Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Write it down on my knees and pray. Sometimes I get up at three or four in the morning and start praying. Mm -hmm. And that, and I ask Him to guide me through the day. Amen. Because without Him, I can do nothing. That's right. So I'm, I'm trying. You know, the worst enemy I have is self. It's myself. That's true. That's for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> so I have to put that aside yes. and just follow His lead. That's yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. Desperately wicked. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So our heart needs a lot of work, doesn't it? Our own heart needs a lot of transforming, a lot of surrendering to the Lord. And when it when it is surrendered, that's when the Lord can really use us, right? He can He can work through us and do a special work to win others. Before I can help anybody else, I have to be right. That's that amen. Yeah. That's right. Amen. You're right. <laughs> so, absolutely. And uh, surrendering to God and having the Holy Spirit, uh, this, is, this is how we can live for Christ. When Christ is living in us, right, He's shining through us and He can use us in His service. So, thinking about the Holy Spirit's work, we know from Genesis 6-3 how He pled with the antediluvians, the people before the flood. And he was working on their hearts, but he says, I'm not always going to strive with man because he, he's flesh, right? And his days will be numbered. So there was a special probationary time given there before the flood. But we see that the Holy Spirit was working and pleading with hearts, but he says, I'm not going to do it forever. So we see how the, the Holy Spirit does this work. In John 16, 8, we also find uh, this place where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, and he says that the Spirit will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, right? So the Holy Spirit does that work to show us where we've been wrong, to show us what is right, what is righteousness, and to show us that God will hold us accountable for what we choose, and to follow God or to follow the world. And so we've got to make the right decision. And the Spirit of God is impressing hearts. Uh, that is God's work that He wants to do to win souls and to transform all of us. So uh, we cannot do it without Him. In fact, Romans 8.26 talks about uh, the Holy Spirit doing a work of intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. I think we're familiar with that verse in Romans 8. And so the Holy Spirit is uh, doing some interceding and some, some work with our prayers, mingling and, and helping that message to come up to God because it says we don't even know what to pray for as we should, right? As we ought to pray. We don't know what to pray. But the Holy Spirit, you know, He comes and he, His presence is there and He helps us and He guides us. And I think that's why the Bible also talks about praying in the Spirit. You know, you see some of those other texts that refer to that. Praying in the Spirit is connecting with God's Spirit and letting, that, letting the Holy Spirit bring our petitions before God's throne, right? So a special work that uh, the Holy Spirit is doing there. Jesus also says that the Father will give us good gifts, right? And what was the, the key point about those good gifts? What is it that we need to do? What's our part? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, Luke 11, 30, ye then be evil. Uh-huh. Amen. He quoted it. There we go. So that's it. So if we know how to give good gifts, we know the Father in heaven knows how to give good gifts to those who ask, right? You know, if we never asked, we would never really appreciate the blessing, right? We would just think that we deserved it. But it's only by God's mercy. It's only by His grace that He gives. And when we humbly petition His throne, we ask for that blessing, then He promises that He sends the blessing and so we have that uh, wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit when we ask. Definitely must be praying for that uh, so we can be able to win souls. If we want the power to win souls, we need to pray for it. Pray that God will use us. The apostles, uh, before they went out to, to begin their mission, their work of sharing the gospel, they had to pray, right? They were in the upper room praying for souls, praying together and becoming more harmonious as a group of believers. 
and just getting ready to go out there. Their hearts were being touched by God's grace and by the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And so the Lord was able to use them mightily and uh, to take them out and, and affect the world. The Bible says in Acts that the, the world was turned upside down, right? As these men went out preaching and proclaiming the gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ. And so what a blessing we have there. Jesus had instructed them, we know from Luke 24, 49, he told them to tarry at Jerusalem until they would be imbued with power from upon high, right? That is the Holy Spirit that uh, Jesus is going to send. He promised to send them. Acts 1.8. Yeah, Acts 1.8 also talks about it. Uh, Luke talks about it right at the end of his gospel. And in Acts 1.8, absolutely. There is a promise of the power there too. And he says, you'll be my witnesses, right? Unto eventually all the ends of the earth. He starts from Jerusalem, works out. That's right. Amen. So there's a principle there of working out. We're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow too. We'll, we'll reference that verse. Amen. Thanks for sharing that. So we definitely want to ask for God's power uh, to win souls and continually rely upon Him. Um, there's, a, there's an example of a, a soul winning, maybe somewhat of a soul winning blunder, <laughs> but Jesus turned it around. It was in Matthew 17. And verse 18, we can look there just briefly, Matthew 17 and verse 18. All right, and it says here that, um, I'll just kind of back up a little bit to explain the story, but I'm sure we're all familiar with it. The disciples were trying to cast out a demon, right? There was this boy who was... Uh, possessed with the Spirit, and the Father was there and was hoping that this thing would be cast out. And Jesus wasn't there at that moment, but he was kind of walking up on the scene and his disciples were over there trying to cast out this demon and they weren't having any success at all. And they're asking, why can't uh, you cast him out? And so Jesus uh, walks up. Notice there, verse 16. Let's, I'll read that one. It says, and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. So here's this father longing for his son to be cured. And he says, I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't cure him. What's, what's going on? Because I, as I understand it, the, the ministry of Jesus has power, and he can do great things. And so this man had great faith. And then here's the disciples. And notice how Jesus answers in verse 17. He said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And so the disciples, they asked, why could we not cast him out? There in the next verse, they're you know, wondering, hey, what, what's the deal? Jesus is able to do it, but we weren't able. You see, they're still learning from Jesus, just like all of us, right? We're still in school, amen? We're still learning from Jesus how to win souls more effectively. And we have to talk with Him. We have to communicate through prayer. Ask the Lord how we can know better about how to win souls, how to reach people for His kingdom. Because God knows the things that we don't know. And there is a spiritual war going on. There are spiritual powers at work. And God is very much aware of all of those powers. And we don't always see it. We don't always realize what, what all is taking place or going on in someone's heart or life or home or whatever the situation, but the Lord knows. He always knows. And so they ask him about that. And Jesus said in verse 20, Because of your unbelief, uh, for verily I say unto you, if ye ha have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And so we see how this connection with God, this here prayer and fasting and faith, right? Faith, belief. They all go together, connecting with the Lord and having that special power. Jesus was a, a much more successful evangelist because he had a much greater connection with the Father. 
Not that the disciples couldn't have it, they could, right? We are all privileged to access God, right? He allows us to access Him through the ministry of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. We can come before Him, we can pray, we can ask for help, and He provides what is needed. He gives the wisdom, the grace, and the power that are necessary. Uh-huh. Verse 19, they came to the disciples to, uh, to Jesus apart and said, why could they not cast him out? And, and Jesus said to them, that first phrase right there is mm -hmm. key because mm -hmm. of your unbelief. Yes. We need to, we need to think about that mm -hmm. because of our unbelief. Why are we still here? Because of our unbelief. Mm. We need to, we need to grasp God's word Mm -hmm. and not waver and not falter. If he said it, we have to accept it and believe it. Sure, and have faith. Yeah, without, without any necessarily outward example or outward um, show, if I might say that, uh, because look at Noah. Mm -hmm. Did he, he had faith because he believed what God told him. Yep. He, he knew the flood was coming by faith. By faith he knew. That's right. God spoke and it was so. There had been no evidence of any rain. Yeah. Yet God said it. I'm building a boat. Now that reminds me of the statement Jesus makes about having the faith like a child, right? Yeah. You know, how they can just ask a question to their parents and mom and dad say so. That must be the way it is. <laughs> hey, you know, they, mom and dad, they know all these things, right? Especially when you're that young, you know, they, you realize they have all the answers, especially to all the things you want to know in your world, right? <laughs> they seem to have the answers. And so God, of course, He does have all the answers. And, yeah, yeah got to have faith in the Lord and faith in His Word. So we got to have that also asking, uh, the faith and the asking uh, through prayer and fasting, petitioning God's throne. And then we have here Ephesians 6.12 where it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against powers, principalities, powers, uh -huh. and spiritual in heavenly places. That's right. So there, it's a spiritual warfare, right? And that's why we need the spiritual power. It's not something you can just arm wrestle, right? You can't just win it in our own strength. And whatever methods or approaches we have, it's not going to work without the blessing and the presence and the power of the Lord working through us to drive back those forces of evil and to reach the hearts of people around us. So what powerful principles we have here in the Bible that teach us how to make war on the devil's kingdom when we go out to share the gospel. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, even to the pulling down of strongholds, right? Yes, casting down of imaginations. That's right. So, powerful weapons, and they are spiritual weapons. And to connect with that power and those weapons, we need prayer and dependence upon the Lord. Yes. Uh -huh. Every high thing that exalteth itself against, against the, the knowledge of God. God. And bringing yep. into captivity mm -hmm. every thought to the obedience of Christ. Mm. There you go. Yeah. That's right. Amen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So we see also the uh, servant of God, Daniel who was praying for a situation. We see it in Daniel 10. There was a work of intercession. We see that he was fasting 21 days. It wasn't a no food fast, but it was a simple food fast. He said he had no pleasant bread, right? So, must have had unpleasant bread, I suppose, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe it was gluten-free bread, I don't know. <laughs> no offense if anyone likes that kind of bread, but uh, yeah, no pleasant bread. It was a simple kind of diet, 
He was uh, fasting there and he was praying about a situation. He was praying about his people and about the return to Jerusalem and the, the upbuilding of things there and praying that the heart of the king would be, would be turned in their favor. And God was working behind the scenes and you know, Daniel didn't see an answer immediately to his prayer. He just kept on praying and the angel in that story he comes to Daniel and he says, your words were heard from the very moment that you set yourself to pray Amen. and to seek the Lord. See, God hears us from the very beginning. And behind the scenes, unbeknownst to Daniel, he couldn't see what was happening. God was working powerfully. The forces of God's angels were working powerfully to help shift things, to change events, to help persuade the king's mind that he needed to let God's people go home. And so what a powerful situation of intercession where he, he wasn't seeing visibly the results, but God was working powerfully. And it took time to bring things into the right alignment and to have the hearts changed. But even Daniel's heart was being uh, transformed through that experience, right? He had to hold on to God in faith. He had to keep praying and petitioning the throne. And, you know, we have to labor long with the Lord, right? I think about what Jesus said in Luke 18 about the importunate widow, right? This woman who's petitioning the judge, the unjust judge, and yet God is a just judge, right? And so it's through that, that continuing. Jesus says that we pray and we faint not, right? We should pray and, and faint not, but, you know, per, be persistent, right? Be persistent. We see that over and over throughout the Bible to labor along with God. Think about Jacob. He was wrestling with the Lord. He didn't give up. He says, I won't let you go unless you bless me, right? He was wrestling with the Lord all night long. And so it's that, it's that wrestling with the Lord. I think about even, even Elijah and uh, the, the king who came and he had to smite the arrows. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this story, but uh, he, the king was told to, to take the arrows and to, to strike them on the ground. And, and he only struck like three times and he said, you know what? That's not enough. You're going to lose the war. You're going to lose the war against Assyria because you should have smitten it five or six times, you know. Keep on going. So there's this persistence, right? Persistence in prayer, you know, unceasing prayer, right? That we, we keep petitioning the Lord. We keep bearing long and praying for souls, right? Praying for those around us, praying for the situations going on. And God will bless and the Lord will prevail and great things will be accomplished as we seek him faithfully. We see also Peter, the apostle, praying on the rooftop when the, um, the Gentiles came to him, Cornelius, right? And God revealed to Peter that he needed to listen to God's word, right? Whatever God said to do, he needed to do it, even if he thought it might be the wrong thing, because the Jews didn't really like the Gentiles at that time, right? But uh, God said, you know what? You need to go with Cornelius and don't call any man common or unclean. I think we're familiar with that story there in the book of Acts. And so he was there praying on the rooftop when he saw that vision. Peter was there praying. And it was about the noon hour, the Bible says, kind of like the middle of the day. And he's hungry and they're preparing food downstairs. But he's, he's up there on the rooftop. He's praying. He's seeking God. He's asking for God's um, strength and grace. And it was in that moment of prayer that God revealed something powerful to him that he needed to know to be able to reach out and win Cornelius, right? If he hadn't heard that message from God during his season of prayer, he would not have been ready to receive Cornelius and to help baptize this man and this whole family and even the, uh, the trickle effect from that family being converted. Imagine the influence from the home of Cornelius when they all accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. That's powerful. You never know what's going to happen when you win even one person or one family and everyone gets converted and it just keeps on going. But the, the direction, the instruction needed came from the Lord above. It was not from human wisdom or earthly wisdom or thinking. It was not from the popular consensus of men because according to the Jews, those Gentiles are unclean. We don't need to go eat with them, right? So if he followed the popular thinking of his day, he would never have won Cornelius over to the faith. 
But uh, because he was praying on his knees and listening for God's voice, God instructed him during those moments of prayer upon his knees. So think about that. The heavenly instruction that God wants to give us, how he wants to impress our minds while we're in the season of prayer so that we can be able to effectively do his work, to reach those souls who God is seeking to bring into connection with us. In fact, I think there's many people around us, even in our own communities, wherever we are, who God would love to connect us with to help win these souls and bring them over to him. But we need to spend more time with him in prayer to receive the direction, the instruction that we'll need to be able to reach those people, to connect with those people, those individuals. And God, will give us the answer. God, he will give the answer, right? So I think that's why it's so important that we're, you know, we're just staying connected. I think about the apostles. That was something they emphasized so strongly is that they needed to be seeking the Lord in prayer. They said, we'll give ourselves to fasting and to prayer and to preaching the word, right? Because they knew that the direction and the power and the grace needed were found through time on their knees with the Lord, right? That's how God opens up those blessings. And so we have the early church. We see them, they were a praying church. Uh, there's many stories that we could look at, you know, Peter being delivered from prison. Uh, that was humanly impossible, right? This man's in prison. How is he going to get out? There's guards all around him. The church was praying for Peter. They got together. They called a prayer meeting and said, hey, let's pray for Peter. How often do we call a special prayer meeting and say, hey, let's pray for these Christians who are, you know, locked up in China or somewhere else. Or let's pray for the Adventist church who's having difficulties. Let's pray for the missionaries and the mission work that's going on. You know, do we have the same burdens on our heart? Do we recognize what's going on and how we can be praying for God's miracles to take place? Because in answer to the, the church's prayer, as they were gathered together praying for Peter, God sent his angel to release Peter from the prison, right? To open those prison doors. And it is also true that as we pray, as uh, believers, we come together and we pray, God will open the prison doors to help people in those kinds of situations, but also people who are bound with the chains of Satan, people who are stuck in the trap of sin. And it seems like there's no way out. It seems hopeless, right? Uh, somehow they're stuck with their you know, smoking or drinking or other sinful habits that are pulling people down. And you wonder, how can, we, how can they get the victory? And how can our even church members get the victory? Do church members sometimes struggle with these same things? Yeah. <laughs> with trials and with sin and problems, right? And sometimes we're quick to go and you know, see if we can set someone straight or rebuke them rather than pray for their soul. Pray for them to have strength to overcome Pray for the power of the Lord to work, to change people's hearts, right? When God's Spirit speaks, it's more powerful than when we speak, isn't it? And He knows just what to say. We don't always know just what to say. And so when we gather, <laughs> when we gather and we pray, God will work miracles to open those prison doors, to let the captives go free. That is what Jesus wants to accomplish. And he said He would let the captives go free. Do I see a hand back there? That's right. And Amen. We just underestimate what, how powerful God is. A thousand ways of which we know nothing, right? right. But God, God knows. Amen. That's exactly right. That's right on point. And so, uh, the Lord is good. He works powerful things when His people pray. When we seek Him. When we depend on Him. So, Colossians 4.12, it says, Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. In fact, we can read that whole verse if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Colossians 4 and verse 12. We'll get over there past Galatians and Ephesians. There we go. And Philippians. Then we get Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Okay, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. 
You know, here was this humble Christian believer from the first century, Epaphras, and he was a warrior for the Lord. He was laboring for souls. And what was his strategy? What was his method of laboring for souls in this case? It, it was prayer. Yeah, absolutely. It was petitioning God's throne for help for them, that, uh, that they might be able to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now that is a prayer warrior, right? <laughs> that is prayer warriors laboring fervently in prayer. Uh, that's just an awesome picture of this, uh, this man of faith uh, who was laboring for souls in prayer. And uh, we need that. We need more of that labor today, amen? We need, we need more laboring together in prayer for those around us, for the lost souls in our families, and even for each other, for all of us to grow in God's grace and for the people here in the community, uh, the people that we see from day to day, maybe down at the bank or that shop that we always go to or, you know, the hair place where we get our hair cuts, wherever it is that we go, you know, there's people that, that we can be praying for. Uh, get to know some of these people around us, get to know each other's names and pray for folks. Put them on our list and even get together as, as believers in the church and say, hey, we want to pray for these souls and see what we can do and what God will do to set people free, to bring them to a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. Now, as we are laboring for souls, the battle gets hotter as souls are approaching to God. Isn't that true? You think the devil wants to let people go easily? No, not without a fight, right? The devil always tries to turn up the heat when people begin coming to the Lord. Right? He turns family members against them. He sends people from next door to tell them they shouldn't do Bible studies or they shouldn't go visit that church or they shouldn't hang out with such people, uh, you know, Christian people or Seventh-day Adventist people. The devil has all sorts of things to deceive people, to try and keep them bound up in his uh, destructive kingdom, right? And so the, the heat is turned up. It is a fierce battle, and we need to be praying even harder, even more, as we are working with souls, praying for those people that God will help us to know how we can reach them most effectively and also how we can be there when they need us, when they need our help, and also how God can put up His shield of protection around them and drive the enemy away and divert the enemy's uh, sophistries that he tries to put in their ears, right? His uh, deceptions that he puts in their ears. So he, he definitely tries to discourage, you know. Years ago, I was doing some meetings out in Kentucky. This was in... Uh, it was with the ASI Youth for Jesus program. I was one of the junior evangelists uh, during the summer of 2007. And so we were out there preaching these meetings and we had some people who were coming out every night. There was, uh, I think it was one of the church members had a van and they would go pick up a group of people from some apartments and they'd bring them out to our meetings every night. And the Holy Spirit was working on their hearts and they were hearing the truth of God's word and they were, they were excited about it. And they were making decisions about it. And the devil began to turn up the heat, right? He saw that people were getting released from his kingdom and they were starting to realize the truth. And the devil was trying to provide distractions and he was also trying to provide a way to get them to stop coming. And so there was this, this uh, person who lived in the apartments there and he realized that this whole group was coming out to our meetings and he decided that we were a cult and that there was something wrong with Seventh-day Adventists, and, and he wasn't going to let, uh, if he could help it, he wasn't going to let these people come out to our meetings. And so he did what he could to try and stop them from coming, and he even got himself some videos to try and show this whole group of people that we were a cult and some kind of scary group, and that they shouldn't even come out to our meetings. You see how the devil was working? Here we are preaching the, the words of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel. God was blessing. People were enjoying it. They were blessed. And the devil is trying to stir up this trouble. Well, I think it was that he discouraged maybe one or two, but uh, the other ones, they, they realized, you know what, this guy is not telling us the truth here. We need to keep going because we know that we're hearing the word of God. We're hearing the Bible open to us. And so, you know, we had to be in prayer 
for all those souls coming. The devil was at work. And uh, even if we don't see it happening, we have to expect it. We have to know that the enemy is working hard against us, you know, to stop souls from coming. So that's just one example. Another example, there was a man named uh, Johnny who I was doing some Bible studies with down in Texas when I was attending Southwestern there for a couple years. And so we were doing studies and Johnny was, was super excited about what he was learning, you know. He's just rejoicing in the Lord. He's like, this is great. This is right from the Bible. And he was already going to a church. It was a little Baptist church of some sort. And so he was going there and and uh, they were telling him, oh, why do you go over and see those Adventists? Why do you go over there and study with those people? You know, they're, they're just wrong. Don't you know that? And so they were trying to discourage him. He's like, well, you know, if they're wrong, maybe I can straighten them out. You know, maybe God will use me to bless them. So he was coming and he was listening. And he was just thinking, well, if I hear anything that's not in the Bible, I'll let him know. Right? So <laughs> he had that mindset. And we were praying for him. You know, we were praying for him. And, and we eventually heard from him. He was telling us some stories. Oh, yeah, well, they... You know, my church has been saying this, trying to discourage, but, you know, we just kept praying for him, and, and he's like, you know what, this is, this is great, this is the truth, I see it in the Bible, it's so clear, you know, who could not follow this truth? And so he made a decision to follow the Lord completely, and he was baptized and became a member of our church out there. Um, so it was all the Lord's work, right? How he was, he was doing a special work on, on our hearts and Johnny's heart, and he made a great decision. But the devil wasn't going to let him go without a fight, right? Always trying to stir up that discouragement. When I was in South Korea serving as a missionary, I also had some experiences like that. People like to throw around those kinds of rumors like, oh, those Christians, they go on Saturday, there's something wrong with them. You know, there must, must be a cult. They're not the real Christians because the real Christians go on Sunday, don't you know that? <laughs> And so they had these, you know, kinds of ideas that would circle around and, and, you know, some of the people would say, oh, those people are a cult. And so we had students coming to our English school and uh, we would, you know, maybe share a little Bible thought with them during our English class to start it out. And then we would invite them to attend a full Bible class where they could come and study the Bible for a whole hour. And so, um, you know, we offered classes every, you know, new classes every couple months. And one of my students that had been coming through my English classes, she was kind of interested in the Bible class, but she was kind of hesitant too. You know, she was really friendly and we had a good relationship and everything. But she told me she's a little bit hesitant, like kind of concerned. Should she take a Bible class? Because I don't know, you know, somebody said you guys were a cult. And, and uh, so I said, you know, she actually let me know that. And, you know, we were praying for her and, I said, you know what, well, I'm going to keep praying for you. And I said, I said, well, you know, it's up to you if you want to take the class. I said, I said, I don't think it's going to be anything scary. We're just going to talk about the Bible. And we'll pray together, and, and you can see for yourself that it's, it's nothing to be worried about. And so I prayed for her, and she went home, and she thought about it. And she decided, well, you know what, I think I'll go ahead and take the class. I don't, I don't think my teacher is going to be that scary. And so she took the class, and she loved it. Right? She loved it, and she began uh, visiting our church more. Uh, so she just had a great experience, and it was totally contrary to what she had been told. And in fact, I think as she told the story, her neighbor even came up to her and said, those people are a cult, and you've got to get out of there. I'm going to pray for you. And she came over to her house and put her hands on her, on my student, the neighbor, laid her hands on my student, was praying for her, Lord, save her from those Adventists. Lord, save her from that school. They've got the devil over there. Imagine that, you know, well-meaning, but very misguided, right? Very wrong, very wrong in her understanding, wrong in her, her theology. So she was trying to intercede, but it was the wrong kind. She didn't even realize it, <laughs> that neighbor. Uh, hopefully she someday will see the truth too, right? But uh, praise God that uh, as we were interceding for our student, we, we didn't have that kind of experience with the laying on of hands, but as we were praying for her, the Lord heard and the Lord blessed and the Lord touched her heart and she came and she was blessed. Amen. So you got to know that we are in a war, right? We are in a battle and God is going to help us. And we just need to keep connecting with him and remember to pray for souls and realize that it will heat up. So pray for the spiritual graces also 
uh, from God to win souls. We need more grace, amen? amen? We need the grace of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. I abbreviate it here a little bit. Um, you can follow along your Bible. I could even turn there if you want to see the whole part. But Ephesians. Let me get, let's see, get turned over there to the right spot. All right. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. Notice here what the Apostle Paul says. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Right? So here the Apostle Paul appealed to the other believers to always be praying, to have all kinds of supplication going on, and to pray for him as a, as a preacher, as a soul winner. You see, I need your prayers. We all need each other's prayers, right? Your pastor here needs prayers. He needs your prayers to have special grace and wisdom from God, right? We all depend on that. I like that song, I Need the Prayers of Those I Love. Have you heard that or sung that hymn? Beautiful hymn. I need the prayers of those I love. You know that one? Yeah. Beautiful hymn. Right? And so we need those prayers. And he appealed for prayer. And uh, the preacher needs to be able to open his mouth boldly. Right? When you speak the truth of God, you have to be bold. Right? And some of the things you've got to say aren't always easy to say. Right? Sometimes, you know, it can be easier, but sometimes you have to say things that aren't necessarily easy to say. And so the Apostle Paul says, pray for me, pray for me, so that I can preach as I should preach, boldly to preach the gospel, right? And so too often there's not enough praying for that kind of stuff, all right? So James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, right? Ask God and he will and he will provide. Now this text, we can't, we can't go by it without reading. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. We've got to look at this, this text here. And then we'll go through the, the other ones a little quicker. Alright, so Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. In fact, I think we just came across this verse earlier. My wife and I were doing some reading in the car and I think we actually came across this verse. But... Uh, it's very powerful. Okay, Isaiah 50 and verse 4, and it says here, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. All right? Think about that. How God used his servant and how God worked with his servant. He'd wake him up in the morning, he'd spend time in prayer, and it was God who gave him the grace needed to speak a word in season to him that was weary, right? So God would give him an understanding. He'd give him a message. He'd give him the words that needed to be shared with someone. And he'd direct him and lead him to just the right someone and help him to give the words in the right season or the right time. You know, a word fitly spoken, as Proverbs says, right? It's like apples of gold <laughs> in settings of silver, right? A word fitly spoken. To have it at just the right time to the right person and uh, let it be the right word. Let it be God's message for the time, right? That's present truth. It's a timely message, isn't it? And so if we want to have an especially relevant ministry work, you know, whether we're a pastor, whether we're an elder, whether we're a deacon or, or a church member, uh, you know, doing other things and uh, doing, doing ministry. We know we all have a personal ministry, amen? We, we all have a calling to work for the Lord somehow to be sharing our faith, sharing the testimony. And so uh, think about that. As we are praying and seeking God early in the morning, God is going to teach us the words that we need for the different people that we need. He'll impress our hearts with uh, people to communicate to and uh, people to pray for and messages to share. 
And when we have our devotional time, you know, God's going to give us some scriptures. And that might be just the scripture you need for somebody to encourage them. And don't be afraid to share, right? When God gives you those opportunities, share what the Lord puts on your heart and uh, pray for people. God's going to teach us how to win people. You know, if we're putting our own words out there and we're not walking close to the Lord, we won't get that close direction. So it's going to be a lot harder to win souls and help people. But when we're really praying to the Lord, God's going to just fit things together. He's going to give us the stuff we need to know and direct us to the people that we need to see. And that's when it all comes together, when the Lord's working like that and we're connecting. So powerful stuff. Well, we'll finish up here tonight with a few uh, quotations, few statements from the pen of inspiration uh, from the writings of Ellen White. Okay, so I think very powerful uh, statements here. Testimonies, volume 7, page 21. Notice this. It says, Why do not believers feel a deeper, more earnest concern for those who are out of Christ? Why do not two or three meet together and plead with God for the salvation of some special one, and then for still another? In our churches, let companies be formed for service. Let difficult uh, sorry, different. Let different ones unite in labor as fishers of men. Let them seek to gather souls from the corruption of the world into the saving purity of Christ's love. That's a powerful statement. You know, why, why do we not feel a deeper, more earnest concern for those who are out of Christ? You know, sometimes we just run about our own life and our own world and we don't have the burden on our souls. For those people who are lost, who are perishing outside of Christ and His truth, and yet we have such a precious message that the Lord has given us. We need to pray for a burden for souls, amen? amen. Pray that God will put it on our hearts, He'll lay it on us heavy, that we will feel the need to make the time and the effort to dedicate ourselves to help win the souls around us, to reach those people in our sphere of influence, to pray for the people around us. Right? God can put that burden on our hearts. And when we get together with, with some other believers and we pray, even two or three gathering together, and we pray for souls, God will begin to put more of a burden on our hearts for them. Right? He'll impress us with how we can reach out to those people. Uh, but, but we need to be praying earnestly, and that's when that'll take place. And notice also here it says, the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. And we know who that is, right? Only God cannot err. He is above all mistakes. And so uh, God said the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort. Huh. Well, imagine that. If we get together with two or three in the church and we, we form some teams, obviously we're all working together and we're not competing that's not encouraged in the church. We don't want to be like the apostles making the same mistake as old, right? They were kind of having a rivalry among themselves. Who's going to be the greatest? That is not the spirit, right, of Jesus. We see over and over again that's not the spirit. But the spirit of Jesus is about working together, right? Working together as a church, as God's people. And uh, God will help us and we can, we can form some teams and form some groups in the church and we're all together as one team, as one body working in Christ. But we, you know, we go out and we, we serve together, you know, two and two or, or three and get together and pray for souls. And, you know, think about all those names we have on the church books, maybe some people who are missing um, or other people that we know in the community. We can get those names and put them together and start praying for these people and then thinking about how we can divide up the work, right? You know your pastor can't do all the work, right? In fact, he's not supposed to. All of us are supposed to do the work, right? All the, all the members of the body of Christ are to function together. Can you imagine a hand all alone trying to do all the work without an arm and without the rest of the body? It'd be a little bit tough, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so, you know, that's why the, the church is described as a body all working together, right? That's why we need to be united. We need to be united. That's right. So I love this statement, you know, the formation of small companies. We get together, we plan things out, we pray together, and uh, we go reach souls for God's kingdom. This one here is from Signs of the Times, January 8, uh, 1880, and it says, Our Savior often spent all night in prayer to His Father. 
coming forth with a rising sun to shed his beams of light upon the world. Imagine that. The sunshine was up in the sky, but there was a sunshine you could probably say was shining even brighter. That was the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Right? Going forth to bless the world. The beams of heavenly light. It says here, with his heart all full of sympathy for the poor, the ignorant and afflicted, he labored that he might elevate fallen man and dispel the moral darkness by the light reflected from himself. That is just beautiful. It reminds me of Moses coming down off the mountaintop with God. The Bible tells us that his face was all aglow with the glory of God. That's amazing. It was so bright they could hardly look. But uh, that's God's grace. And Jesus came from the mountain filled with the presence and the grace of God uh, to bring blessings to the world, blessings to those around him. And so imagine if we spend the, those moments with the Lord in prayer like Jesus did, and we can come fresh from that time of prayer with wonderful blessings of heavenly sunshine, right, to help those around us. To, to reach souls for God. Here's from Pastoral Ministry, page 282, and it says, Christ is our example. His life was a life of prayer. Yes, Christ, the Son of God, equal with the Father, Himself all-sufficient, the storehouse of all blessings, He whose voice could rebuke disease, still the tempest, and call the dead to life, prayed with strong crying and many tears. He often spent whole nights in prayer. While the cities were hushed in their slumber, angels listened to the pleadings of the Redeemer. That's a powerful statement. Jesus poured out his heart. His life was a life of prayer. We, we titled this message, uh, you know, praying as Jesus did, right? Uh, seeking, seeking the Lord just like Jesus, uh, winning souls His way. And we see that Christ is our example here, right? His life was a life of prayer. He would spend those nights in prayer and He would plead for all those people. And God blessed Him. God gave Him wisdom to reach those souls around Him. So powerful. See the Savior bowed in prayer, his soul wrung with anguish. He is not praying for himself, but for those whom he came to save. In the mountains of Galilee and in the groves of all of it, the beloved of God prayed for sinners. Then he came forth to minister to them, his tongue touched anew with living fire. Imagine that, a heavenly fire. We need that heavenly fire to touch our tongues so that we can be able to minister, right? If we don't uh, charge up with the presence of the Lord, we are not able to minister effectively. But Jesus was filled with that grace from above, and he was able to effectively reach the souls around him. And we need more of that filling, amen? amen. We need more of that presence of the Lord that comes from spending that time seeking him and praying for the people around us, for the world around us, praying that our own hearts will be transformed and that we can do that special work. So Christ has set the example of ministry for us. Power came from heaven to strengthen Jesus for his duty. Uh, long nights were spent in prayer and the result was great blessings to all. So that brings us to our, our closing question here and it says, is it your desire, is it our desire and commitment to pray more for the lost souls around us and for the grace we need to be able to reach them. Do we want to pray for those things? And pray more and seek the Lord for that grace to reach souls, to have our hearts in tune with the Lord and with His Spirit. All right, uh, let us pray for that this evening, shall we? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings, for the grace that you give through Jesus Christ, through the examples that you show us throughout your word, that uh, there is a great need of seeking you in prayer, in humble petition before your throne. 
And Lord, we ask that you will help us to be able to work together as a church, to work together wisely by your grace, by the infilling of your spirit, that we would be people of prayer, spending that time praying when we're at home and praying also together, calling, uh, calling others and getting together and praying for those lost souls around us, Lord. Help us to think of the names of people that we haven't thought of, Lord. Help us to have more of a burden on our hearts for the souls around us. If we have that burden, that passion, and we have the grace and the blessing from, from you and even the words to speak in the right season to the right person, we know that we'll be able to reach people for your kingdom. And so, Lord, we just want to ask you uh, this evening that you will help us. Help us, Lord, to grow as we should. Help us, Lord, to be seeking you in prayer and be empowered to win souls as we should, to win souls for your kingdom. Lord, may you touch our hearts with that grace from heaven and instill in us a passionate desire to seek and to save the lost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.